Is vaccination a choice or a responsibility? The events of the last year have tested that balance between our personal freedoms and our obligations to the people around us. So what can policymakers learn from the response of Europe's citizens and its governments? Hello again, Matthias. Hello, Tim. Now, Matthias, in your uh, CEPR Policy Insight, you examine what you call the hurdles and the lessons from vaccination strategies across Europe. So uh, let's start off, first of all, with what happened in the beginning. In the first half of this year, was there much variation in the, the strategy, the rate of vaccination across Europe? Well, in the first half of, uh, of 2021, uh, there was reasonably uh, good and similar progress uh, across Europe. Um, of course, this is due to the fact that the European Union had uh, taken over the um, the bargaining with the companies about uh, prices and deliveries, and of course they have been uh, they have been criticised for. Uh, having uh, slower deliveries than uh, Israel or the UK or even the US. Uh, but the good news was that uh, it was uh, kind of uh, equal deliveries per capita. And uh, so that was, I think, uh, important. And uh, what we could see is that most countries, with very few exceptions, were able to organize it logistically, the vaccination, with the doses they had had. Of course, the fact that the doses arrived somewhat more slowly than some other countries made the logistics easier. Uh, but frankly, until April, I would say, uh, most countries were uh, progressing at equal rates or close to equal rates. And it's only when we started hitting the vaccine hesitancy constraint that uh, we could see some variance in performance. Now, uh, this is the important constraint, isn't it? Because you point out that during this time, there was an inherent contradiction in the messaging that was coming from governments about vaccination. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yes, I think there was probably one of the biggest communication blunders of the whole uh, vaccination uh, uh, programme was the fact that initially governments said, and most governments did say, two things that were potentially inconsistent. One, we will reach herd immunity. Uh, and two, vaccination will be a personal choice, a free choice. And uh, of course, it became more complicated when, well, first of all, it was not obvious at the time with the original virus immune uh, uh, herd immunity was supposed to be around 70% of the population. But then with the alpha variant, it became 80%. And with the delta variant, which we have now, it became 90%. And clearly, uh, simply through personal choice, uh, it was not possible to reach that level. So I don't want to be, uh, I think it would have been much better to say, look, uh, of course, in the beginning, we don't have many doses. Plus, we don't know exactly how safe the vaccine is, even though it had been approved, of course, authorized. But so we will start first with people uh, who are fragile and who are eager to be vaccinated. Uh, these are the easiest people to, to reach, and it was a good idea to do that first. But then we should have said, look, and then we will see how safe uh, the vaccines are, we will learn more and more, and uh, we will see how how much progress we can achieve, and if needed, we will change the policy and the requirements, just like with uh, the non-pharmaceutical intervention, closing sectors, uh, uh, putting limits on mobility and the like, we of course don't like to do that, but if needed, we do it, and with vaccination, we should have done the same thing, and it would have been less inconsistent than what we have seen uh, 
in recent months. But Matthias, policy has always had to make this trade-off, hasn't it, between our uh, responsibilities to the community and our, our, our personal rights. Is this just the same problem, just with a, a bit more urgency and higher stakes? Well, there are, of course, uh, similarities in the sense that, uh, indeed, there are costs and benefits of every policy. You know, taxation can help redistribution. At times, it can create some uh, some distortions, and so we have to balance that. I think uh, the specificity here is that we are talking about different types of choices, and uh, it's normal that people think, you know, uh, vaccination. If I don't like it, I don't want to be uh, to be uh, imposed. Uh, so the stakes have been indeed much higher in terms of personal freedoms. But that started already in uh, early 2020. Uh, we've had restrictions on our personal freedoms that had been unheard of uh, since World War II. Uh, and it was done uh, because you need to have this trade-off. So indeed, I agree that uh, the uh, this is in a sense not that new, but much higher stakes. I think also it is uh, something where the evidence move, moves uh, quickly and you you need to convey the idea that, uh, okay, science is learning every day, and uh, sorry, what we thought uh, true at some point may become less true now, or even false, and uh, at the same time, uh, some people are more willing to uh, to uh, navigate in this reasoning than others, and so uh, that's a challenge for politicians, for experts, uh, and for the public. Now, a large part of this paper focuses on what's now known across Europe colloquially as the Corona Pass um, that was introduced as we hit this vaccine hesitancy constraint. Can you explain what it is, why it's important in this context? I think what is important is that today, uh, I think almost 30 countries in Europe are using versions of it. Uh, And by the way, the European Union started very early saying, look, for crossing borders, we will introduce this uh, safety instrument. And uh, of course, countries differ in, uh, in how, for which activities they require it. But some similarities are that uh, it's typically a requirement to be either vaccinated or to have caught it uh, in the last six months, which also give you some immunity, or to be negatively tested. So it's typically uh, uh, one of three options, even though some countries are now uh, going from three options to two options. But uh, so that's the the thing. Now, um, it looks like it's the instrument of choice in many countries, which is somewhere between um, complete freedom and a vaccine mandate. So you can see the Corona Pass as a vaccine mandate with uh, two additional options. Either you don't have to be vaccinated if you had it in the last six months, or if you choose to be tested. Then the question is the test free, just like the vaccine for the the person, or uh, is it uh, something that you have to pay? And gradually, countries that use it uh, ask people to pay for for the testing uh, because the idea is that and there is this whole debate uh, some people say what is this Uh, we were promised it would be a free choice but it's not a free choice anymore it is a mandate by another name because you have to pay for being tested or even to catch it Uh, of course uh, that's not the uh, the preference the idea is not that more people catch it but um, so indeed uh, it is a kind of implicit coercion. I think that it's so popular today because governments don't want to think in our countries uh, what happens if you have a mandate and people resist. Do you put them in prison? (laughs) It is unpleasant. So you give them the testing option for now. Uh, But let's face it, we are in the middle of this thing. The Delta variant is nasty. And we see that in a number of European countries today, uh, we are again with a so-called fourth wave, and we don't know how big it will be. 
But clearly it is becoming worrisome again. Which countries committed particularly strongly to this idea of a, a pass where you're vaccinated, you have the freedom to do things? And which ones decided that this was inconsistent with what they wanted? Well, as I say, by now, uh, many countries have it. Uh, some countries started early, like Denmark, outside of Europe, also Israel. Um, some countries still don't have it. And for example, fr uh, Spain has reached quite a high vaccination rate, at least 80% uh, of the entire population with at least one dose. Uh, the government, uh, the Sanchez government, wanted to introduce it, but uh, the Supreme Court in Spain uh, said, no way, you cannot do that. Uh, so it suggests that it is possible to have high vaccination without it. Um, the country where it seems to have had the most effect is France. Uh, France was a vaccine laggard in uh, the first half of July. And then on July 12, President Macron went in a typical French way uh, on all the television channels uh, to uh, solemnly announce the thing. And the, and the response, as I argue and as I document in the paper, was massive. Uh, One million appointments, vaccination appointments immediately afterwards. And today, indeed, uh, I think France was 6% behind Germany at the time and is now 7% ahead of Germany. Uh, France is not, is among the good pupils in Western Europe and Eastern Europe is typically lagging Western Europe, but uh, it is in a group of uh, countries including uh, Denmark, Italy, uh, Finland, Belgium and the Netherlands. So it has caught up with these countries. Um, Germany, as I say, is, uh, is behind, just like Austria, even though they have tried versions of the pass too. So the pass is neither necessary, like Spain shows, nor sufficient, like Germany or Austria show. But uh, if done well, it can, be, it can be helpful. And I think there, the centralization that is typical of France, seems to have worked, even though France is also known for having a lot of uh, demonstration and the like, and they've had that. But I think, given that it has been quite popular, and typically the past is popular with vaccinated people, who think, you know, this is a way to increase vaccination and to make sure that uh, it is safer for everybody. Um, also, even if people don't get vaccinated, but they get get they get tested and are negative when they join events, restaurants and the like, it is safety enhancing. So in that sense, uh, I think it's helpful. And indeed, I think France is an interesting case study where it was done well and has, has had a big impact. Yes, you, you talked about the impact amongst the vaccinated, but we're thinking here about vaccine hesitant or anti-vaxxers. Has it had a consistent effect on them? Has it changed their opinion or has it made them get vaccinated? Do we know? Well, I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, a number of countries have uh, at least delayed the introduction of uh, this pass is that there have been uh, studies, uh, surveys of people uh, asking them, are you vaccinated or not? And if not, or if, if vaccinated, what do you think of the uh, vaccination pass, uh, corona pass, and would that change your decision? And uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, people who are already vaccinated are quite positive about the introduction of the pass. Not everybody is, but uh, a number of, many people are. But unvaccinated people see it more as a coercion, and some of them are clearly saying, look, you know, and many of them are saying in these, uh, in these surveys, I wouldn't do it. Now, uh, of course, there is always a difference between uh, a hypothetical situation and, you know, all of a sudden, in order to go to the restaurant with your friends who are all vaccinated, uh, uh, do you uh, set aside your hesitancy? And uh, now, interestingly, in France, uh, where, you know, the website All World in Data shows uh, uh, for every 15th of the month 
the share of people who are vaccinated, who are willing to be vaccinated but not yet vaccinated, not yet vaccinated and hesitant, and not yet vaccinated and not thinking they will get vaccinated. And I think there, what it shows is that the people who are uh, not willing to be vaccinated have gone the first month before the announcement of uh, President Macron, June 15, there were, I think, 35% of French people who were still not considering vaccination. And uh, this has gone down to 20%. So clearly, uh, you see that there, the, the backlash isn't seen in the data. Um, and I think for other countries, the main difference between France and a number of other countries is that not that it has had a backlash, but that it has had much less of an impact. So France is not the uh, median country, it's the country where it has worked best. Now, an interesting country to follow is Italy. Uh, Italy has now introduced the uh, CST, the, the uh, Corona Pass, for work and maybe also higher education. While until now, all countries have gone for a Corona Pass for, let's say, leisure activities. You know, sports, uh, restaurants and cafes, culture, events, of course. Uh, of course, Europe started very early uh, requiring it for crossing borders. So that's a bit of the, of the paradox that it was introduced in Europe without... Uh, much controversy, but domestic uses have have generated controversy. Um, but so it will be interesting to see whether Italy, uh, I think by now France and Italy, and of course things can change fast, but by now France and Italy are, uh, you know, uh, kind of similarly vaccinated uh, and uh, doing pretty well. Uh, and uh, let's see whether, of course, it can always lead at some point to complacency. Uh, and so we have to be worried about this because the Delta variant is a, is a nasty guy. But uh, the, uh, for now, these countries are uh, doing pretty well, together also with even higher vaccinated Spain and Portugal. In Portugal, almost everybody who is uh, eligible to have a vaccine uh, is vaccinated, I think 98%, which is just uh, amazing. Matthias, this has highlighted the the cultural and legal differences, uh, not just within countries, but between countries in Europe, hasn't it? Is it possible to draw any conclusions from how uh, these vaccine passports have been implemented and taken up about what we might need to do next time that we have to have a mass vaccination if that involves some element of coercion? Well, as I say, I think uh, probably from the start, um, if indeed we have such a massive epidemic where we need to develop very, very fast new vaccines, <coughs> which will kind of uh, uh, unavoidably generate some resistance. I think uh, starting with the proper communication saying, look, this is one tool to fight a situation which we are all victims of, and therefore we will need to have a rational cost-benefit analysis of vaccination policy, just like we have gradually had this cost-benefit analysis of partial lockdowns, semi-lockdowns and the like. I think these are complicated trade-offs indeed, and we all need to be uh, reasonably uh, kind of altruistic and realize that uh, some of us will uh, suffer from this in different ways, economically, psychologically, and so on, and uh, that we need to find ways to... Uh, to uh, kind of uh, give compensation to the victims, economic and, and all, uh, psychological and all. And there, for example, on vaccination, one way we, one thing we give to vaccine hesitant is that, okay, we will not start with you. We will start with people who want to be vaccinated and are, are indeed. Uh, so that's something you should thank us for that. You should thank people who start with it to take the risk for the community. 
And then when it gets safer, sorry, we may want to ask you to be vaccinated to make sure uh, that uh, you protect others, knowing that in any case, we are asking you to do something that will first protect you. <laughs> so, uh, because indeed, the vaccine is, uh, is uh, the, the first and biggest benefit of the vaccine is to protect uh, the vaccinated person from hospitalization and death. Uh, it's only in a second step that it also protects significantly, but less so than uh, for the risk of uh, severe disease, but it also protects uh, others. And so uh, at some level, indeed, uh, society is uh, a balance between uh, in individual and collective interest. Well, let's hope we find that balance, Matthias. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. Matthias's paper is called Vaccination Strategies in the Midst of an Epidemic. It is Policy Insight 110 at the CEPR, and you can download it using this link. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.